Hello students, this is Professor McDermott coming to you from my home office, uh, accompanied by my faithful dog Daisy, who's giving me moral support, uh, so that I can talk to you about another aspect of life in the Gilded Age, namely labor relations. The most dramatic event um, in the Gilded Age in terms of labor relations came to be known as the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. And it started uh, when the B&O Railroad, that is the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which you may be familiar with from the game of Monopoly, um, in the midst of the depression of the 1870s decided to cut the wages for all of its workers. And so those workers immediately went out on strike. But it didn't stop there because uh, railroad workers who worked for other railroad systems also went out on strike to so show their sympathy for the B&O strikers. Um, and so this really had a huge effect on the American economy in terms of basically bringing the railroads um, to a grinding halt. And uh, if you look at the um, map at the top left there, you see all the many different places where there was strike activity um, in 1877 on the railroads. And furthermore, these strikes were quite violent in many places. In Pittsburgh, for example, um, there was a, a huge riot at the railroad station uh, in Pittsburgh, and you see the aftermath of that in these pictures. Um, there were actually 25 people killed during the riot in Pittsburgh, and also uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 killed in the city of Chicago. Well, uh, not surprisingly, um, the President of the United States, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, decided to send in federal troops, that is the army, to try to restore order um, in the places that were affected by strikes, and they did uh, ruthlessly put down uh, the strikes it's interesting that um, it was really this episode in 1877 that led to the creation of the modern National Guard. Now, there had been militia units like the Minutemen uh, in America since the beginning of colonial times, but it was in 1877, because of the violence, that many state governors decided they needed to have some kind of military force at their disposable, disposal that they could call in in case of uh, violence. And so uh, the modern National Guard really uh, dates back to this great railroad strike of 1877. But uh, not everybody approved of what Hayes had done in suppressing the strike so, uh, so effectively. Um, and the opinions of those who were sympathetic to the strikers were reflected in a very important Supreme Court decision of 1877 in which the court held that uh, state governments especially could regulate large corporations when it was necessary um, to the public interest, uh, showing that some Americans at least had started to get worried about the effects of giant corporations and the increasing control they seemed to have over the economic life of Americans. The most important uh, labor union in this early part of the Gilded Age was called the Knights of Labor. Their leader was a man named Terence Powderly. Uh, he had the title Grand Master Workman. Um, under Powderly, the Knights of Labor were a very unusual labor union by modern standards. Um, instead of trying to organize certain types of workers, they would organize entire industries in fact, they were pretty much open to any worker who wanted to join, including women, African Americans, and members of other minority groups, immigrant groups. With one exception, they did not encourage Chinese workers to join the Knights of Labor, which shows you that really uh, the Chinese were the most hated immigrant group in America. We'll talk more later in the course about uh, the reasons for this and the suffering that Chinese workers endured in this country. Also, uh, the Knights of Labor actually tended to avoid strikes whenever possible and avoid violent confrontations. 
they really had an idealistic view. Their goal was nothing less than to rebuild American society according to what was called direct democracy. That is, empowering people at the local level to make decisions that affected their own lives by forming citizens committees, for example. Uh, part of this uh, belief resulted in the creation of cooperatives for workers similar to those the Grange had created for farmers uh, so that workers could join together and uh, pool their resources and try to have more clout in dealing with um, uh, corporations and with uh, merchants. One of the uh, most important groups that was allied with the Knights of Labor was the Farmers Alliance. This was a group of farmers that more or less by the 1880s had replaced uh, the Grange, but carried on many of its uh, programs. So I want to talk about the worldview of the other side in these labor disputes, namely the capitalists. Capitalists were big businessmen who had a lot of capital, that is money. Um, and so what was, what was their worldview? How did it differ from that of the laborers and the farmers? Well, um, I think that the capitalist worldview maybe was best expressed by John D. Rockefeller, the president of the Standard Oil Trust, um, who once said, quote, the growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest. It is merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God, end quote. And in that short quote, Rockefeller drew on two uh, very important sets of ideas in the American tradition. Uh, one of them, of course, was Darwinism. When he says survival of the fittest, he's making a reference to the theories of Charles Darwin, and I'm sure you're familiar with the theory of evolution, the idea that human beings evolved from lower forms of life through a process called natural selection, in which um, this the uh, individuals or species that were best adapted to their own environment survived and the others died out, became extinct. Um, and so people call this process survival of the fittest. Um, and so when Rockefeller talks about survival of the fittest, essentially what he's saying is that businesses have to grow in order to survive and corporations have to expand um, become bigger and bigger if they're going to survive and then um, they also will drive smaller uh, companies out of business and that is simply part of the way of things and it's to be expected. But in the second half of that quote um, Rockefeller speaks of the law of nature and the law of God and here he's drawing on an even older American tradition that dates back uh, for centuries, but was perhaps best expressed by Thomas Jefferson in uh, the Declaration of Independence when, he, when Jefferson said that the American Revolution was based on the laws of nature and of nature's God. In other words, um, this law of nature uh, was God's law for human beings and for human society. And uh, coming along, going along with this natural law idea um, was the idea of natural rights, the idea that human beings had certain rights that came from God. And Jefferson lists them in the Declaration as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So what is Rockefeller trying to do by drawing on this way of thinking? Um, essentially, he's making an argument that the growth and expansion of giant corporations is part of God's plan for the world and for American society, and it's useless to try to uh, oppose that. It's interesting, too, that when big business tycoons like Rockefeller um, used concepts like natural rights, um, they changed them in significant ways. They didn't really emphasize, like Jefferson had, for instance, the right to life or the right to liberty. Instead, they were mainly focused on the right to property. 
the idea that once you had accumulated some property, it was your God-given right to keep it. And nobody could take it away from you, not the government, not a labor union. Um, it was sacred. And also the idea that contracts um, were sacred, contracts between free individuals. And so capitalists really believed um, in the idea of free labor, that any worker had the right to sell his labor to any employer um, no matter how low the price was and no labor union should be allowed to step in to try to negotiate higher uh, wages and no government should be allowed to uh, step in and set say a minimum wage that this was entirely an agreement a contract between the capitalist uh, and the worker also very important to the capitalist worldview um, was the idea that anybody could become a great success in American society if they only worked hard enough. This was called pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. In other words, uh, not relying on anybody else for help, but simply relying on your own um, hard work and your own moral virtue to help you get ahead. This view was expressed in a number of books that were very popular during this period. Um, perhaps the first self-help book ever written in 1859 by Samuel Smiles and called appropriately enough self-help um, taught this view. Also there was a very popular author of children's books during the Gilded Age named Horatio Alger. Um, published a number of books about uh, poor boys with names like Tattered Tom and Ragged Dick um, who didn't have uh, a penny to their name but eventually through hard work and, and thrift worked their way up and became uh, wealthy and prosperous men. And so this really uh, became a very important part of the American dream, the idea that anybody um, could make it in society if they only uh, worked hard enough. If they uh, played the game according to the rules, they could make it. Now, let's examine how the capitalist worldview was different from the worldview of workers and uh, farmers. Um, first of all, in terms of government, the capitalists really wanted the government to be very small and uh, not to interfere in the economy generally, except when it could do something to benefit the capitalists. So the capitalists would sometimes go to government to ask for favors. For instance, the railroad companies had gotten large grants of free land so that they could build uh, railroads from uh, state and federal governments. But uh, otherwise, they thought the government should stay out of the economy, that is, when it didn't benefit them. Most um, capitalists and big business tycoons joined the Republican Party, and this really wasn't because they agreed with the ideals of the Republican Party, um, which in many ways was much more liberal than the Democratic Party at that time. But it was mainly because after the Civil War, the Republicans were the strongest party, especially in the North. And so uh, the capitalists wanted to go with uh, the winning team. And so uh, increasingly, the Republican Party began to be um, populated and influenced by these big business leaders. Um, also, uh, capitalists really favored tight money. Um, they didn't want a large money supply. They didn't want silver coins. They preferred uh, that everything be kept on the gold standard, okay? And this would help to keep wages down especially. On the other hand, um, laborers and farmers, as we've seen, really wanted to empower people to, in a sense, take control of the government one means that they devised to do this was called the referendum, that is, putting important questions on election ballots so that the people could vote on them instead of, say, state legislators or Congress. Um, farmers and laborers also were much more open 
to the idea of the government being very active in regulating the economy. And uh, sometimes they even went so far as to suggest that government should take over certain key industries, like the railroad business, for example, and operate them for the benefit of the people. So this was a big difference between the labor worldview and the capitalist worldview. Um, laborers often did admire people like Andrew Carnegie, uh, the great steel magnate who had worked themselves up from uh, poverty, but they really didn't tr trust large corporations and they feared the effects of the increasingly giant corporations on American society. Uh, laborers and farmers, of course, also wanted to inflate the currency. They wanted a larger money supply. They wanted silver coins, not just gold coins, again, so that they would have more money in their pockets and would be able to pay their debts more easily. Now, these two worldviews did actually have some things in common. For instance, very few of the laborers actually uh, were in favor of the idea of an all-out war between capitalists and workers. In other words, they mostly American workers rejected the idea of communism, uh, which had been started by Karl Marx in uh, Europe in the 1840s. A large number of European workers had become communists and were in fact uh, hoping for a major revolution to destroy um, capitalists and take over society. And this actually did happen in Russia in 1917. But for the most part, workers in the United States really weren't uh, buying what the communists were selling, and they, they didn't go along with this uh, very radical worldview. Also, it's quite interesting that even the capitalists um, often promoted cooperation in society rather than the idea of every man for himself. Um, so much like the farmers or the workers who were making cooperatives, big business people also cooperated with each other for mutual um, benefit. And one example of this kind of big business cooperation we call the trust. What is a trust? Well, a trust is when a whole lot of competitors in a certain industry get together and decide to join forces and form one giant um, corporation to control that entire industry. Um, the classic example of this is the Standard Oil Trust, which was controlled by John D. Rockefeller and was started in 1882. Basically, um, John D. Rockefeller was only one oil tycoon among many, but he had a vision for um, the oil industry. And basically, he went to many of the other uh, presidents of oil companies and asked them to join with him in a giant super corporation. And he warned them that if they didn't, that they would all be run out of business. So through this combination of encouragement and threats, Rockefeller got uh, most of the leaders of the oil business to join with him in the Standard Oil Trust. Basically, every oil country, company surrendered its stock to a board of trustees, which was controlled by Rockefeller. And so, after 1882, the entire oil industry was basically controlled by this one giant corporation, Standard Oil. And you can see the advantages, I think, pretty clearly. By eliminating competition, uh, the Standard Oil Trust enabled Rockefeller uh, basically to set the price of oil um, throughout the country because when companies are competing with each other that tends to drive prices down because they're all trying to cut their prices to get customers, right? But with only one big oil company, Rockefeller could set the prices as high as he wanted to. Um, and this was good as he saw it for the oil business. But also it meant that wages could often be lowered um, because there were no opportunities now. Um, let's say that you were an oil employee, that was your only skill and you didn't like the wage that you were being paid by Standard Oil, well, well where were you going to go? Uh, there was no competition anymore and so essentially you were stuck with whatever low wages Standard Oil offered you. It was uh, a very brilliant 
plan, but it was a plan that became increasingly controversial, um, as we'll see. I want to talk about some problems with the uh, goals and the plans of the laborers, uh, especially the Knights of Labor. Now, the Knights of Labor um, really did well coming out of the Depression of the 1870s. In fact, they had accumulated about three quarters of a million members by the year 1886. But instead of uh, adding to the power of the Knights of Labor, this increase in their numbers tended to undermine their unity and cohesion. Why? Because the Knights had been so successful that uh, many people joined them who really didn't agree with Powderly's ideas, especially people joined the Knights now um, who really were much more violent and radical, who wanted to have frequent strikes or maybe even overthrow uh, the government and have class warfare. Uh, against Powderly's wishes. So that tended to undermine the Knights of Labor. Another problem for the Knights of Labor had to do with the political situation in the country. Um, and to give an example of this uh, dilemma, let's talk about the 1884 presidential election in which Grover Cleveland became the one and only Democrat ever to be elected president uh, between 1865 and 1900. Uh, how did that come about? Well, it was primarily because many Republicans, <clears throat> that is, members of the GOP or Grand Old Party, thought that their candidate, James G. Blaine, was too corrupt. And so a large number of Republicans uh, bolted from the Republican Party and voted for the Democrat Cleveland instead. These people came to be known as mugwumps, because it was said they had their mug in one party and their wump in the other. Cleveland was a controversial candidate uh, partly because of an incident that had taken place earlier in his life. In 1874, um, he had had an affair with a young woman and uh, she became pregnant and she said that he was the father. And uh, Grover Cleveland did the gentlemanly thing. He acknowledged his paternity of the child. He supported them uh, financially from that point forward. But um, in the 1870s and 1880s, that was a big scandal. Uh, and so whenever Cleveland would have a camp campaign rally, Republicans would always show up and they would chant, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, in an attempt to clean, clean up his image, um, Grover Cleveland got married <clears throat> um, at a late age, and he and his young wife, while he was in the White House, um, had a baby, a, a girl, whom they named uh, Ruth. And Ruth Cleveland became a national um, celebrity, so much so that a candy company decided to create a new candy bar, which they named after her. Uh, Baby Ruth, uh, which uh, is still obviously sold today, and you may be familiar with it. No, it was not named after Babe Ruth, the baseball player. It was named after Baby Ruth Cleveland. But uh, Grover Cleveland was a deeply conservative man in many ways, and he had very little sympathy, especially for um, workers and, and, and their demands. With the Republican Party, too, increasingly being taken over by big business interests, that meant that, really, uh, the workers did not have a political home. They didn't have a party they could look to for support. Essentially, they were on their own. Um, and that fact became even more evident in the year 1886, which was uh, a year of tremendous upheaval. In fact, uh, the entire year became known as the Great Upheaval of 1886 because of all the labor unrest that took place. For example, in April of 1886, there was another railroad strike in East St. Louis, uh, Illinois, which led to the deaths of 11 people. Meanwhile, in Chicago, a huge strike had been going on at uh, the factory of the McCormick Reaper uh, company. This was uh, a, 
a farm uh, implement that was used to reap grain. Um, and so McCormick, uh, when his workers went on strike, uh, essentially locked them out, that is, fired them, and instead hired scabs. What is a scab? Well, a, a scab is a name for someone who's called in to replace striking workers so that, so that factories can continue to operate even though the workers are on uh, strike. And of course, um, members of labor unions absolutely hated uh, scabs, and scabs were often the target of violence by members of labor unions. The situation became even more um, dramatic in uh, May. Um, in Chicago on May the 3rd, the police fired and killed uh, on two striking laborers, and in protest the leaders of the labor union called for a massive um, nonviolent demonstration to take place in a square in downtown Chicago called um, Haymarket Square uh, on May 4th. Now during this um, demonstration the vast majority of the workers were nonviolent but um, at one point a bomb exploded in Haymarket Square and eight policemen were killed um, by the bomb. And this uh, Haymarket bombing really sent the entire country into uh, an uproar. And people really wanted revenge. It was almost like uh, the impact of 9-11. The whole country was uh, very angry, really wanted retribution for the deaths of these uh, policemen. And so uh, the police basically rounded up eight people that had been involved in the strikes, even though they had no evidence um, to uh, prove that they had actually bombed, set off the bomb in Haymarket Square. Um, they were convicted. Seven of them were sentenced to death. Uh, four were actually executed. And so these um, execution victims became known as the Haymarket Martyrs, um, because they had died for the cause of labor. However, uh, the effects of this uh, Haymarket bombing were devastating for the labor movement. First of all, Terence Powderly, who didn't like strikes and didn't like violence, refused to give any kind of support um, to the people who had been accused of the bombing when they were on trial. And uh, most of the members of the Knights were very angry about this because they felt that these men had been framed. And so there was a massive loss in membership for the Knights of Labor. About two-thirds of the members of the Knights simply quit uh, over that issue. Uh, furthermore, uh, in the midst of the popular outrage about the deaths of the policemen, uh, the government was able to send in um, forces to suppress all the strikes, and basically all of the workers who had been locked out uh, did lose their jobs permanently. So uh, there's a huge backlash uh, against the labor movement because of the Haymarket bombing. And once again, that was reflected in a Supreme Court decision. And don't ever let anybody tell you that the Supreme Court is above politics. Really, the, the Supreme Court decisions are very much affected by what's going on. Uh, politically in the country. Um, and in this case, the Supreme Court basically joined the backlash against labor by ruling that uh, even though in their earlier decision they said states should regulate businesses, now they said that individual states could not regulate businesses if they were involved in interstate commerce, that is, if they sold any goods across uh, state lines. So that also was a setback for workers. However, the federal government at this point did uh, step in after that Supreme Court decision. Since the Supreme Court had said that only the federal government could regulate interstate commerce, um, Congress did in 1887 pass a law called the Interstate Commerce Act, um, the goal of which was to regulate especially the railroad industry in the national interest. But really, uh, this fizzled out. The Interstate Commerce Commission was created after this, and they 
um, did to some extent oversee the railroads, but really did not do very much uh, in terms of changing the way railroads did business. Another um, potentially pro-labor uh, law was passed during the administration of Benjamin Harrison, who was Republican president um, beginning in 1889, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Now the goal of the Sherman Act was essentially to break up um, corporations like the Standard Oil Trust, what we call monopolies. <laughs> That's again where the name uh, comes from of that uh, famous game uh, Monopoly. A monopoly is basically a trust. It's a corporation that controls an entire sector of industry. So the Sherman Antitrust Act allowed the federal government to break up, quote, combinations and restraint of trade, end quote. However, <laughs> even though this law was aimed against monopolies and giant corporations, in the early years after the Sherman Antitrust Act, it was mostly actually used against labor unions um, to break up strikes. So really, this law at first was not used um, to benefit workers at all. That would change later, as we'll see. As the Knights declined after Haymarket, a new union um, moved to the forefront of the labor movement, and that was the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which was founded in 1886 by a man named um, Samuel Gompers, uh, who was a professional cigar, uh, cigar worker. Okay. Um, now, the American Federation of Labor had a very different approach to organizing uh, laborers than the Knights of Labor had had. They did not try to organize entire industries. They did not accept every worker. Instead, they focused on um, creating what were called craft unions, that is, um, unions of people who had some kind of special skill. So for instance, unions of machinists or pipe fitters. Um, these tended to be uh, the better off workers and they also tended to be white male workers. And so the AFL was really uh, much less open to women, blacks, members of minority groups, um, much more focused on the needs of white male um, skilled workers. But a new organization formed to take up the cause for uh, the more marginalized groups in society. Um, this group was called the People's Party, better known as the Populists. Um, the Populists were, were a political party that was formed in 1892, uh, mostly by members of the Farmers Alliance and also former members of the Knights of Labor. Uh, who came together at a uh, convention in Omaha, Nebraska to create this populist party. Um, one of the main organizers of the populist party was a very fiery uh, young woman named Mary Elizabeth Lees, uh, who went around the country making um, rabble-rousing speeches, in one of which uh, she said that farmers should, quote, raise less corn and more hell. Um, so this was a more radical uh, group, especially than the AFL, let's say. Uh, and some of the reforms they called for uh, were extremely progressive. For instance, they wanted legislation to limit workers to an eight-hour day. This was at a time when many workers worked uh, 12 or 13-hour days or sometimes even longer, six days a week. They also wanted a national income tax that was graduated. That means rich people would have to pay more and poor people would pay um, a lower percentage of their income in taxes. Uh, there was no income tax in the United States um, at that time uh, because it was believed to be unconstitutional, but the populists uh, were among the first to call for this. Also, they wanted the, uh, the federal government to nationalize the railroad industry, take it over, and also uh, especially the populists were in favor of silver coinage and their rallying cry was free silver, free silver coinage to inflate the currency. And really the populists did remarkably well <clears throat> in the 1892 election for a third party. Their candidate, James B. Weaver, managed to win eight and a half percent of the vote. However, um, Democrat 
Grover Cleveland came out of retirement and actually defeated Harrison and came back into the White House, making him the only president to serve two uh, non-consecutive terms uh, in office. A year later, in 1893, uh, came a really extraordinary display of the power and potential of American capitalism in Chicago. Uh, a World's Fair that was called the World's Columbian Exposition. And this was really a showcase for many of the new inventions that were being made and that were really transforming um, American life. For instance, um, electric lighting. The Westinghouse Corporation illuminated um, the World's Columbian Ex um, Exposition with uh, more than 100,000 um, electric lamps. And so this uh, brilliantly lighted uh, World's Fair at night became known as the White City. Also on display was um, Alexander Graham Bell's recent invention of the telephone. And so what you see here, sometimes historians call this the second industrial revolution with the um, increasingly high-tech inventions like electric lighting, like the telephone, that would really transform um, all of our lives in decades to come. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit more about Andrew Carnegie. I mentioned him earlier. Um, basically, Andrew Carnegie uh, created his own trust to control the steel industry called the Carnegie Steel Company. Uh, later became U.S. Steel. Um, in one of Carnegie's steel plants at a place called Homestead in Pennsylvania, um, the workers had been unionized by uh, one of the AFL's craft unions, the Amalgamated Association of Iron, Steel, and Tin Workers, and they went out on strike in 1892 at Homestead to complain about wage cuts and also workers losing their jobs because of new heavy machinery that was being invented. And Carnegie's response was um, to hire members of the Pinkertons. This was a private detective agency that sometimes hired themselves out uh, to break uh, strikes or for, for crowd control. Um, and so Carnegie brought in uh, a number of Pinkertons uh, on boats to the Homestead factory and when the Pinkertons got off their boats they were attacked by the strikers and there was uh, a very fierce uh, gun battle uh, there at Homestead in which 16 people were killed. After that the governor of Pennsylvania decided to call in the National Guard um, and put down the strike and then Carnegie hired a large number of scabs to operate the plant and this um, is kind of interesting who he hired. He hired African-American workers as scabs. Now, why would African-Americans be willing to cross a picket line and take jobs away from striking workers? Well, the answer is obvious because they were subjected to so much discrimination in industry that this was almost the only way they could get this kind of good um, factory job. So uh, for them, it was a rare opportunity that they were usually denied. But for white workers, um, it was a reason to resent African-American laborers and caused uh, a lot of resentment and ill feeling between white and black workers, this tendency of blacks to hire on as scabs. Well, um, once again, uh, the Homestead strike ended in defeat for the laborers, basically. Um, the National Guard rounded up the leaders of the strike, put them in jail, and the strike um, collapsed. But there would be a great deal more strike activity to come later in the 1890s, because in 1893, another major depression hit the country. Um, 500 banks and approximately 16,000 businesses shut their doors during this depression of 1893 to 1897. And this led to more labor unrest as wages were cut and workers were laid off. In 1894 alone, there uh, were 1,394 labor strikes in the United States. 
the most famous being uh, the American Railway Union's strike against the Pullman Car Company. This was um, a company founded by George K Pullman that made refrigerated cars for uh, railroads. And um, Grover Cleveland, not surprisingly, uh, intervened on behalf of the Pullman Company against the strikers on the grounds that the strikers were interrupting the mail service. Um, Cleveland got a court injunction and sent in uh, federal troops to break the strike. Um, also, the leader of the American Railway Union, Eugene V. Debs, was thrown into jail. We'll meet him later in our story. Um, and it's perhaps fitting that uh, one of the last attempts in the 1890s to strike a blow for uh, oppressed and forgotten workers uh, became such a comic episode. I'm talking about the incident of what was called Coxey's Army. Um, Jacob Coxey was um, from the Midwest and he had become very concerned about the hardship that um, many workers were suffering during the Depression. And so he, he got a large number of unemployed people together and formed a group called the Common Wheel of Christ. And um, this group formulated demands of the federal government. For instance, they wanted the government to print up more paper money and also to hire people, put them on the government payroll to do things like build roads, uh, public works projects. And so led by Coxie, this army of unemployed and discontented workers headed for Washington, D.C. Um, and they actually made it to Washington on foot but when they reached the U.S. Capitol building, Jacob Coxey was arrested for walking on the grass, <laughs> was thrown in jail, and his bewildered army um, disbanded, and that was the end of Coxey's army. So not many victories for laborers and farmers in the 1890s, but um, as we'll see, uh, the progressive era was about to begin, and uh, that would change a great deal. <laughs>